You taste the, the Holy Spirit, he becomes, a, you take a little sip, and he becomes a river of water flowing out of you. Uh, this is the nature of what we're dealing with. And I want to enter into that today. I don't know about you. I want to be part of that. We want to sing one song and then move, give all the time over to Jeff. Uh, <laughs> That's when I start speaking. <laughs> so, yeah, breakfast is at 8, 8.15. Something like that. Something like that. Yeah, let's, it's, all, it's all relative. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to uh, sing the first verse, and uh, if you can be up here by the end of the first verse, Jeff, then we can. <laughs> what? Song number 518, that might be good. Huh? I'll just start singing it. You guys can figure it out. Standing on the promises. No, 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 I'm sorry. 518. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Habit. <laughs> yes, that's right. So then we got that eight in there. 518, standing on the promises. And so we should probably stand. Standing on the promises of Christ my King, their eternal ages for His praises ring. Glory in the highest I will shout and sing, I'm standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises, standing on the promises, standing on the promises, God my Savior. Standing on the promises, standing on the promises, I'm standing on the promises of God. Okay, third verse. This is good. Standing on the promises of Christ the Lord, bound to Him eternally by love's strong cord, overcoming daily with the Spirit's sword, standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises, standing on the promises, standing on the promises, God my Savior, standing, I'm standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. Let us pray. Father God, we are asking for your Holy Spirit because we're hungry for it. We're so hungry that we don't even realize how hungry we are. So Father, please pour, your, pour yourself out today as you, as you always love and delight to do. You are sufficient. You are all sufficient. There is no shadow in you at all. Father, we love you. We thank you for Jeff, for his testimony. We ask for your power on heaven to flow through him. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, good morning. I had visions of myself waking up. Uh, and being late. I thought, oh no, I'm, I'm going to roll out of bed and just be late and somebody's going to have to wake me up. Oh, you're supposed to speak. But I, I did wake up. I, I, uh, it's fun when you're visiting with people. Your mouth gets tired of talking. I, you know, last night I visited with some folk after the meeting and then visited with another young man. And, you know, I was trying to stay awake while I was talking with him, and it was good to climb in bed. I was just a little worried I wasn't going to wake up in time this morning, but God is good. Um, I don't know what it is about young boys, but we like things that explode. <laughs> I was always trying to, as a kid, we'd, I'd make uh, pop bottle bombs, I'd call them, and you know, you could take uh, certain ingredients from the house. I don't want to divulge all the information. <laughs> But you could take certain ingredients and mix other ingredients and put the lid on, and that old one-liter pop bottle would go to the size of a two-liter pop bottle, and then it would make a bang that you know that shake the woods up, and we, it was a, you know that was really cool. We did a lot of that. Mom started complaining about certain ingredients, you know, being depleted rather rapidly in the house, and probably had to bring that to a stop. But uh, uh, say again. Oh. Uh, the, uh, 
So we were talking about how to ignite things last night, how to get started, and it was pretty, some pretty simple steps. So let's just have a quick review. What's the first one? Move. Yep, that's right. Time. I Actually, you're right. In the notes, I talked about how to reach people and time and influence are really key factors in reaching hearts. But the first step in actually igniting is moving. And you just got to do, you got to get started. And you start with something that's close by. Don't, don't start with, I mean, Thailand's a good place. Want to go there. India's a good place. Go. But don't forget that today we have divine appointments. And today I'm praying for a divine appointment to meet with people. And so I, I, uh, we, we start with what's close and we use what we have. And then we need to practice. We've got to just put it into practice. Just start. Don't worry about it if you mess it up. There's no way. It, you'll never learn if you never do it. You know, and Christianity is not a spectator, a spectator sport. We, we've got to participate. We've got to do it. And I was telling someone this morning, I was like, you know, it's like having someone explain to you and describe to you this amazing food that they tried. And you'll just never know what it tastes like unless you eat it. Right? It's like durian. Almost. I don't know if any of you know about durian, but there's a there's an amazing movie on the on the YouTube. YouTube's got some cool stuff, and there's there is uh, they're trying the animals trying durian, and you're watching the cat try and bury it. He smells it, and he starts to try and bury it. It smells kind of awful. Tastes some people say tastes good. Smells bad. Uh, I have finally tasted a little durian, but before everybody was just talking about this. I've never smelled it. Never tasted it. I would just laugh at the movies because I can't believe, you know, some animal would try and bury a piece of fruit and things are passing out. It smells, it smells quite atrocious, apparently, but tastes good. Uh, we, have, we have to taste and see, the Bible says. So, we've got to practice. Um, so today I was going to talk about, well, after you start something, we, it really, we, we don't want to just, it's not just a start. We want an explosion. And uh, I always, especially me, I don't know, I want to see big things happen. And uh, however, I have found that the longer I've been in the mission field, the more God does nothing like I expect him to. No, he doesn't. He does it quite differently. And, uh, and I want to take us to a verse this morning. It's in Mark chapter 4. And Jesus is trying to explain the kingdom of heaven to his disciples. And uh, the kingdom of heaven, you know, the disciples have expectations about what the kingdom of heaven is going to look like. Jesus is going to do all these great, amazing things. They're going to free him from the Romans and do all this stuff. And uh, I, I believe we as Adventists have similar expectations about what the end is going to look like, what the latter rain is going to look like, what the outpouring of the Holy and all the events that are going to, the loud cry. We hear all these terms and we have our expectations set, but I'm always a little uh, nervous about my own expectations because my experience has told me many times it's quite wrong. And I'm looking at Mark chapter 4 and starting in verse 26, and Jesus begins, he says, So is the kingdom of God as a man who should cast seed into the ground. Now, I tell people, I live in a farming community. They're immigrant workers, many migrant workers. Some of them are illegal immigrants, but they're farmers. And I say, you know, as farmers, you guys can get a doctorate in theology. Because farming and salvation are, they're, they're very, very similar. You know, our process, we're baptism is like being buried. And then we grow, we're new trees. Anyway, lots of things. I can't teach all the lessons on that. But Jesus is saying, hey, by the way, the kingdom is like a seed that's been cast into the ground. Now, I must tell you that I struggle with patience. I'm very impatient. I like everything to happen very, very quickly. I'm often very optimistic about how fast things will happen. <laughs> And I'm right now in the middle of this building, this warehouse, and in my mind, I think, you know, I'll have this thing cranked out in about three weeks. And I know that's not going to happen. Uh, already, when I figured out that the steel that I got is, like, super hard, and I've got to pre-drill everything, 
And I have about 20,000 screws to drill just to build, well, no, about 16,000 screws to put in just to build the trusses. And I think, ooh, big project. Kind of wake up in the middle of the night, cold sweat. But at the end, I, I love framing. I love framing with wood, wood framing, because it's the nail gun. You know, just those things going real fast. And we would, we would walk on a slab, and eight days later, there'd be a house there. And it sounds, that's an explosion. It looks really cool. We, we would do that with three guys, and it was, it was fun. It's exciting, because you see big change. Farming is not the same. I planted onions once. And uh, the onion planting was quite, I've never farmed much. In fact, uh, if you ask about skills in the mission field, there's two that are the most difficult. And uh, I'm always trying to recruit people with these skills. One, the most, most difficult that I've found is farmers. Uh, it's difficult to farm in the tropics. There's a lot of things that will kill and eat what you're planting. Weeds grow, like, unbelievably well. And, huh? They grow like weeds. They grow like weeds <laughs> very quickly, year-round. And uh, anyway, it's, a, it's quite a difficult task. Uh, you know, it's one thing to grow food at 7,000 feet. It's one thing to grow it at sea level in the tropics. Very different. Uh, and so anyway, farmers is one, and mechanics is the other. And uh, I, of course, I do a little mechanics out of sheer necessity because I haven't been very successful in recruiting mechanics, but I was this morning. Tyler, you need to go to the mission field and be a mechanic there. I'm doing my recruit job. That's my nephew. <laughs> I needed more mechanics in the mission field. Go. And so, uh, but farming, I've always wanted to learn about it. So I, I, I just kind of jumped off the cliff and I planted an acre of onions. You know, why go halfway? So we just, we plowed up an acre, and I thought, let's go for this onion thing, and I planted them, and, you know, onion seeds are quite, from seed, that's what they did there, you know, and so onion seeds are quite small, and they grow really slow. <laughs> yeah, if you're planting onions from seed, now most of us here, I believe, probably plant from sets, which is little bulb things, and I didn't, never done that, don't know, I've just heard about it. Uh, but uh, the seed process is quite slow. So you plant that little seed, and I'm going to have to, like, bale hay from the weeds, like, four times before that seed gets about that tall. <laughs> you know, the weeds are, like, they're, like, growing great. Man, they're, you know, I'm out there weeding, and I've got a real re-weed. Re it was my first crop on this, you know, I just plowed in all this, you know, no, uh, you know a hay field kind of, you know, more or less. So the weeds are just a tremendous. And, uh, and these onions are growing really slow. I mean, they, like four weeks and they're like that tall. Boy, that's depressing. I remember, uh, in fact, in construction, there's some processes that are very similar to that. I worked on a, we were, I was building a 17,000 square foot media center in Bolivia. It was a big steel building and it was a, a project that I didn't really want to do and I don't have time to tell you about all this, but I... I, I made the commitment to do it, and one of the, my least favorite parts of construction is the foundation work. It's a lot of work that you see nothing. You, know, you never see it when it's done. It's just buried. And so here we are. We've dug these huge holes. I've been working out there a month, and I poured over, I want to say, almost 1,000 bags of concrete. And that to, what I have to show for it is a thin little band that goes around this stretch of dirt and my secretary comes out to look at it and I kid you not this is what she says she says this is all you've done in a month and you know she wasn't out there when sand is pounding in my ears I'm 12 feet under the ground pouring this huge piling that these you know columns are going to sit on those are all buried you don't see any of it this is all you've done? Oh, you know, it's totally the opposite of things that explode, you know. It was fun the next day when we started setting all this red iron, and I have a crane out there, and we're putting bolts, and it's real easy, you know, just bolts. It's not, no, the foundation's not going like this. And all of a sudden, in like four days, you see this huge building stand. Wow, they're like, that it was really amazing. And I thought, well, you don't know, the really amazing work was in the foundation. <laughs> But we don't see that. So it's not near so exciting. 
And so this verse says the kingdom of heaven is as a, if a man should cast a seed into the ground. And then what does he do? He sleeps and he rises day and night and the seed should spring up and grow up and he knoweth not how. I just want you to mark this in your Bibles and remember this. This is the kingdom of heaven. This is how it works. I don't know why. I would like to farm. I tell people this all the time. I would love farming. If I could get out corn and plant it and the next morning be harvesting. <laughs> this would be good. This would be a lot of fun. I mean, I'd be, and I kind of almost, you know, some crops are a little faster than others. Lettuce is a little quicker. Cucumbers grow a little faster. You know, zucchini, some of them are a little easier than others. But, uh, boy, onions were definitely not slow, very slow. And, uh, you know, it almost takes like five months for onions. I it took me almost five months to harvest these onions. And in the process, you know, I didn't know there were so many things that could eat them, kill them crowd them out, and to get a crop out of them, it was just tremendous. Uh, but, you know, if I could plant to the thing, and overnight it would happen, then, I, man, I would be the best farmer in the world. <laughs> I would be into farming. But it doesn't work that So, you know, when you think about exploding and farming, like, I don't think the same thing. Like, that doesn't, no, that's not going to happen. So, uh I want to mention something. To, well, let me, let's go to another uh, verse first, and then I'll, I'll tell this little story. Uh, John chapter 4. Jesus is sitting at the well. You know, he's on a, he's, he's on a trip, and we might, we might say that he's at the rest area, if we were to translate that in modern terms, Right? He's cruised into the gas station, or he's at the rest area. You know, if you're on a toll road, it would be the combo. It would be the rest area, gas station, restaurant mix. And uh, the disciples cruise off, and they're looking for lunch, right? I don't know if you've ever been around people that, like, lunchtime comes, and, man, they get desperate to find food. Uh, don't hang out with me if you're one of those people, because I forget to eat. And uh, my wife doesn't, though. And so if she's along, you're in good hands. If I'm along, we're in, it's not going to be pretty. Uh, Ray can testify. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, 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 so the disciples are all out finding food. And Jesus sits down, and he is waiting for a divine appointment. And this woman comes, and we know the story. And I want to just bring out a few, a few aspects of it that are really important. Jesus took that time with that woman, and at the end of their conversation, she goes and does something. What does she do? Yeah, with one conversation, he wins an entire city. Now, in, the, the, in this story, there are so many lessons. I wish I could you know, extract all of them. Interestingly enough, do you know who the Samaritans were? Who, were, who was the Samaritan? I, sometimes we kind of use terms in the Bible, but we don't translate them into our day-to-day. -day. If we were to translate a Samaritan in today's language, first of all, did they keep the Sabbath? Yes, they, they did keep the Sabbath. They had partial truth. In fact, they were kind of a mix. We might call them a dissident, Right? They might be someone that we would kind of consider has, uh, eh, well, I'm trying to think of the word I did. Uh, we kind of have an offshoot. Yeah, that's, that's a good word. We just use that. They're an offshoot. And we tend to want to kind of, oh, you're an offshoot, and we're like, hmm. You know, we want to step a little ways. You don't, oh, you don't believe that, and you have that doctrine. And you notice, by the way, in the little conversation, she brings up the controversial stuff like, which temple should we worship in? How did Jesus take all that? Did he get, in, did he get sidetracked by any of those things? He's <laughs> like, listen. And oftentimes, we kind of make mountains out of molehills. I've got to be honest with you. We, oh, man, these people just, they're preaching heresy. 
we should not be worshiping in Samaria. And, you know, they've got to change. And Jesus did not address any of those things. And he addressed the heart. And uh, when he had the heart, he knew that it, it, it's amazing how that, that transformation happened. And he saw such potential in that city. And this is the same city that before the disciples were saying, you know, we should call uh, fire down from heaven. And Jesus, no, 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 we're not going to burn this. I got a harvest in that city. In fact, so from one meeting resulted an explosion. Now, as a kid, I learned something about explosive things. Uh, did you know that flour is explosive? <laughs> yep. Orange peels are explosive. You know, as a, you know, you're always trying. But one of the coolest explosive things I never knew was sanding dust. The dust from my sanders was very explosive. I could take balls of it and throw it in the fire and make this huge fireball. Woof! And man, that was really fun. I'd, my brother was a hardwood floor finisher. So he'd bring back bags of this stuff. And I'd sit out there and build a fire, and I'd take that stuff out there, and I'd make all these fire bombs, and I was blowing, you know. It was really exciting, and I thought, I didn't know wood could be so explosive. You know, I, nobody's ever thought of a log as explosive, but it's not explosive unless it's really small. It's got to be really small. And in fact, that's the part that we don't realize. We, a lot of times, Jeff, I should say, thinks of the big things as the important things. Those are the things that are really going to be impactful. And the reality is it's the small things that are truly explosive. The smaller it is, that's why I have to use powdered sugar in my rockets. It's very fine. And the finer, the smaller, the more explosive it is. And uh, that, a lot of times we're distracted. We think, man, if we had the big TV station or if we had the big airplane or if we had the big, you know, property or whatever the big picture we can think of is and we miss the small details of a woman sitting at a well, that one encounter was explosive. And uh, I, I can tell you that uh, many times, and I want to just share my personal testimony, the, the, the pastor of this church, his wife, I know. And, and she was a, uh, a teacher, an instructor for Amazing Facts uh, back many years ago now. Uh, <laughs> it's getting more and more years ago. This is back in 1999, and uh, not that long ago. It was just a little, it was, yeah, no, thanks, John. You're making me feel better. That was just a couple weeks ago, really. Uh, I have a tendency to say that. It was last week, and I think, no, oh, well, maybe that was last year. No, actually, it was a, a couple, wait. That was a while back, actually, you know, uh, but it all seems like yesterday. And so uh, I remember I was a young man s searching for purpose, and uh, I had went out there to Bible work, and her example was very inspiring to me. And it was one of the, one of the things that her, her love for people was inspiring to me. And I, I'm sharing this because her influence in my life, though that month that I was there, had a profound influence as I carried on. Now, she went her way, and I went my way. But that encounter, many of those lessons still stuck with me, and the results of that now are carrying on. How many people have I been able to share with because of her influence in my life when I was 17? We don't know the impact. That's why the kingdom of heaven is quite different. It's like a seed. We plant a seed. You don't know the power of just one encounter. We want to think, ah, we, we would like to see the explosion, just like I would like to see the big change, and that's why I like construction, don't like mechanics, and don't like foundational work. And quite frankly, mission work, 
and, and working it for people. I tell people, I, I tell the Lord, Lord, I'd be a wonderful missionary if it wasn't for people. <laughs> you know, these people, these guys don't get it. They're so slow. You know, I don't get it. I'm so slow. But, uh, you know, because haven't you ever wondered, why, why don't I get, just get baptized and all my sinful traits of character just disappear? Wouldn't that be great? I, I mean, I hear the stories... Of, as somebody told me, it was like a light switch went off, or I just all of a sudden stopped wanting to do bad things. And I think, man, I'd love to have that experience. No, for me, it's been quite different, you know. I kind of repeat the same problem over and over, and I struggle, and I struggle, and I fall, and I struggle, and I, you know, this, this patience thing, you know, it's, it's I'm, still, I'm still in school. I'm hoping to graduate first grade pretty soon, you know. <laughs> I tell the Lord, we gotta, we got to hustle on this thing, you know, you're coming. And I, I know he's patient. I, I don't want to tell you that I'm the one that's delaying it, but it might very well possibly be. <laughs> Sorry, I'm trying my best. <laughs> uh, but, you know, <laughs> he's with just you and me. Yeah. Well, we're, we'll hurry. We've got to hurry. We want the Lord to come. Uh, so we want to see those big results, but oftentimes we... Because we're looking for those things, we miss the actual things that make the big results. Uh, the kingdom of heaven is like a seed. Those seeds, we're planting them. We can't miss those opportunities. That's why those opportunities come every day. If we start seeing how Jesus sees, that's why I, might, I know I, I see. The longer I've been in the mission field, the more I realize I, I don't think anything like Jesus thinks. He, he thinks really way quite different than me. I'm oftentimes giving him advice on how he should do things. I don't know if you guys do that in your prayer life, you know. God, you know, if you would just listen a, a little bit more often, <laughs> things would go better. At least my way. And he doesn't ever do that. I, I, uh, so, uh, John 6 you know, and I want to go in, I told you, you know, people, that as Americans, I think worldwide, money is a, is a big issue. It's one of those obstacles that we struggle with. Uh, so, um, the resource. And uh, John 6 is the story of feeding the 5,000. And I want to meet that young man, that lad. I wonder, what, you know, what he grew up to be from that experience. Because I know that if he brought lunch, I don't know. Maybe he, his mom and dad were there, and mom and dad said, oh, you can give us our lunch. But the size of the lunch wasn't a size for three or four. It was really about the size of, for one kid to eat his lunch, right? So he must have come on his own. Mom and dad probably had to do something else. And, you know, it's interesting. I have met young, I, the church I go to, there are many young people that come without their parents to church. Uh, and uh, they want to follow God. I was thinking, Beaver, about your experience with your daughter sharing with uh, one of your neighbors. And, and how the, the children of the parents sometimes respond quicker to the gospel. And this young man is responding to the gospel and he, he offers his lunch. Now, I don't know about you guys when you went to school, but my lunch was like the treasure, and I had kind of a normal lunch. But what I would try and always do, I'd always try and bring something I could trade to kind of upgrade my lunch, you know? <laughs> and uh, I don't know if you had anybody else did that, but I always, you know, mine was peanut butter and jelly sandwiches or if I was lucky, I'd start doing the bagels. And the bagels had a little bit more trading power than a peanut. Peanut butter and jelly sandwich was like, you could never up, upgrade from a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. That was, there was no trading that. But bagels I could trade, and, you know, I might be able to trade a bagel for a, a stripple sandwich. So, you know, but my lunch was like, I would trade, but I would never give it away. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm, like, I'm a young kid, man. That, that lunch, I got to eat the whole thing. And still, I'd like to have a little more. And so I'm thinking about this kid, and he, he didn't ask Jesus, he didn't trade his lunch with Jesus. He gave it to him. And a lot of times, I feel like the things that I'm doing in the mission field, all I really have is a lunch. Compared, what is a lunch compared to feeding 5,000 people? And... 
many times the temptation is to say, I might as well just eat it because it's not going to make a difference. It'll make no difference anyway. And, and, you know, as we're hearing, we're hearing of the needs. And we're here and we're thinking about, wow, I want to help with the mission field. And, the, and, and, and somebody throws out, well, we need, a, you know, $10,000 or $100,000. And all of a sudden you think, well, but what's $100 to $100,000? And the temptation is just to say, well, I could just, you know, there's a couple Phillips in my SUV. Uh, maybe... I don't know, God's going to have to do the big thing. And we miss the opportunity to do the small thing that explodes. I think that young man, it, you know, God doesn't, you have to, God doesn't need our lunch. He doesn't need our money. And, uh, and, and it doesn't, you know, we, we kind of want to quantify things as the size of gifts. The size really means nothing. It's percentages that God cares about. Did you know that? And you know what the percentage, it's, you know, when you get a percentage, it's a fraction of something. It's relation, you know, you have the base number and the top number. So it, it's a percentage of what you have to what you gave that makes it valuable. Does that make sense? You follow what I'm saying? So the young man gave, did he say, Jesus, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to split my lunch with you. Now, that, I, might have, I might have done that. All right, Jesus, I got two bagels and an apple, and I got a little Debbie. Listen, in my little Debbie, it's the, it's the nutty bar, so we, I'll give you a stick, and I'll eat a stick. <laughs> That's exactly what I saw a young guy watching me. Somebody gave me some fruit leather, and I watched this little boy. He was watching me eat that fruit leather. His eyes were real big, you know. So I split it in half. I gave him half, and I ate half. And I told him, hey, you should share your half with somebody else, too, so... <laughs> I gave half. Oh, anyway, you know, but this guy, he didn't split it. How much did he give? He gave all of it. That concept is difficult for us to do because when we give it, we think that we've lost it. But the kingdom of heaven doesn't work that way. If you want to have something explode... You've got to give it. And, and I have experienced that over and over and over again. And we know the story of the widow's might. That's in Mark chapter 12. The boy's lunch is in John chapter 10, but the widow's might. And this widow, she brings and casts in. And, and by the way, Jesus is always paying attention to the small details. That's the small things that are explosive. She just casts in just a couple of coins. And it reminds me of the story of a Mexican widow that I was told. She was, uh, she was quite poor, and she says, you know, God, I want to give you more. I want to give more to the work. And, uh, and so she said, listen, I... Uh, I want to live on only absolutely what I need, and everything extra I want to put in your work. And, you know, um, she cleaned houses. That's what she did. She was a house cleaning. She was, a, she was elderly, a widow. And uh, she began to get her phone, more phone calls. You know, uh, Mrs. So-and-so, Mrs. Sanchez, we'll call her. You know, I have a house that we we're, we're just got back from a trip, and I need some help cleaning the house. And the phone started ringing. And she started giving, and, and she st it was just amazing. Each week, she would have more and more, and then she had some people start to help her. And all of a sudden, uh, she, and she was giving at the church, and the treasurer noticed. You know, the treasurers kind of know. I don't know if any of you guys have been treasurers, but, you know, they know who, it's a, who gives and who doesn't. They've got to tally up. And all of a sudden, she's like, how is Mrs. Sanchez giving so much money? And so they finally, it, it went on for a while, and finally she kind of, the, the, the amount kept increasing until she was the one who, who was giving the most in the church. And it, it, it got her a visit from the pastor. And uh, the pastor says, you know, uh, Mrs. Sanchez, you don't need, to, you, you live in, a, in quite a poor situation. Uh, why don't you, uh, 
You don't need to give that much. Oh, she said, I, I, I couldn't stop. That's, and she began to explain the deal with God. You know, I, uh, if I didn't give, I wouldn't get it. And it is so exciting. And, and, you know, it was amazing. She began to give more than the whole church. God began to bless her. And she just kept the same slice that she had at the beginning. And the percentage of giving kept going up. And uh, it's an amazing ex experience and story. And, and people ask me, you know, this is the classic most asked question. Most people don't ask me, Jeff, how do you save a soul? You know, how do you, uh, how do you win souls to Christ? No, 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 no. They ask me, Jeff, how do you survive as a missionary? How do the, how do the financial part work? I mean, how do you do the money thing? Because it's something that human nature worries about quite a little bit. Let's go back to Matthew chapter 6. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk a little bit about it this morning. I wish, I, you know, it's hard. You want to give instruction and teach people to fly and, and do the whole gamut in, in, three, in three brief moments. It's a bit of a challenge. But we just, we're going to plant a few seeds. And you know what's really cool is the Holy Spirit water those things. And there'll be an explosion. Mm -hmm. You're going to see it. So uh, it says, therefore, uh, Matthew 6, verse 25, it says, Therefore I, t I say to you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body what you shall put on. Is not your life more than meat and the body more than, uh, and the body than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, for they neither sow not, neither do they reap, neither do they gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are you not much better than they? Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit to his stature? And why take ye thought for your raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they toil not, neither do they spin. Yet I say unto you that Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not more clothe ye, O you of little faith? Therefore, he repeats it, take no thought, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of these things. But seek first, what? the kingdom of God. And his righteousness in all these things shall be added unto you. You know, we read that verse. We're very familiar with it. But the verses preceding that, we don't necessarily think about too much. Human nature is to take care of yourself first and then seek God's kingdom. And that is really hard to get over and I, and I, you know, I invite people to become missionaries. I was having a conversation with a gentleman last night, and I think to myself, he's got a good job. He's an airline pilot. And I say, you know, I'd like you to come and be a missionary pilot. And what do I have to offer him? Well, I'd like to say that, you know, we've got a plan, and I've got a nice 401k set up, and a nice salary, and we have... but. I don't have that to offer him. And in fact, I, I, it's something that I've struggled with in my mind a lot because I say, God, I want to recruit people with have skills and talents. And it's very difficult to do that if you take a young man, he's not, you know, he's still young, but, you know, in mid-40s, kind of established, has a family, and has the mindset, I need to provide for my family. And what do I tell them? Well, all I can do is share my experience because it's difficult. How do you learn that God will provide if you've never experienced it? Uh, because we feel like a lot of times that we provide for ourselves. Now, I will tell you that God actually is providing in all of those experiences. God, in his graciousness, is providing through a means of another employer and he provides employment. I'm not saying that. But a lot of times we think that we did it. 
we think that it's ours. When we give 10% back, we say, oh, that's God's, and the rest is ours. No, no. It's all his. Just 10% he wants us to give to the church to help sustain it. That's it. Now, when I started out, I made a deal with God, because you remember I talked about practice. you got to kind of practice this, this concept. You don't learn to trust a promise in the Bible. I look at promises in the Bible as an instrument. It's, an, it's something that God says, hey, I will do this for you. And you're like, yeah, okay, but how do I really know? Well, you don't really know unless you try it. And sometimes I would suggest it's easier to try it before you get into the storm. Most of the time we don't practice flying instruments. We don't learn how to fly instruments in a thunderstorm. We typically learn how to do it in good weather with an instructor sitting beside us, and we're practicing these things. And so I would encourage you to practice some of this. Well, my wife and I, we, when we started 15 years ago, 16 years ago, can I say 16 yet or is it? Okay, good, because... I always say, I, I, I jump ahead a few years, and she's always correcting me. I've noticed that's been a kind of a common trend, John. <laughs> I noticed that the guy in the, in the video, the Skype, his wife's like, hey, it's time to quit. Time to quit, you know? I've noticed that your wife does that occasionally, and I've experienced that from my wife occasionally, too. You know, so it's a, it's a common theme. Anyway, <laughs> they keep us straight. So... Uh, the, when we went, I said, God, I'll work for you if you take care of me. So, um, basically what I've done is I've tried to seek first the kingdom of God. Say, God, what is it that you want me to do? I work for God. And, uh, and I do a lot of different kinds of things. You know, sometimes you, if you, I don't know, you walk into your job and the boss says, today I want you to go work out in the shop, or today I want you to go, you know, build this road, or today I want you to run this tractor if it's a ranch or whatever, I don't know, all kinds of jobs, the boss gives you different tasks, and that's kind of how I feel, I'm like, Lord, if you want me to fly an airplane, I'll fly an airplane, if you want me to fix a car, I'll fix a car, if you want me to fix someone else's car, I'm happy to fix someone else's car, if you want me to preach, I'll preach, if you want me to, t whatever that job is for the day, I'm happy to do that, that's, I'm working for you. And uh, in exchange that you take care of my family. So I used to use the term volunteer. And I don't really use that term anymore because I get paid. God pays me somehow. I got clothes on. I got, God takes care of me. It's just that he is very creative in how he writes that paycheck. <laughs> very creative. And, uh, and, and, and really, honestly, for the majority of the time, the, how I, my personal survival is not one of the things I worry about too often. Most of the time, that God takes care of that, and we have what we need. I will, I will say this. There are times, though, when I get a little worried about it. Now, on my deal with God, our personal things, I never mention to anyone. I go to the boss. I work for him. Why would I go to some? You know, if your boss is paying you, you're working for him, and the boss is paying you, do you go to another business to ask them to pay you? No, I mean, I, and John works at a hospital there, and he would be like, well, I've done all these surgeries, and he goes over to Sacred Heart. I don't think you, are you working at Sacred Heart? No. So he goes over to a different brand of a hospital and says, hey, by the way, my hospital's not paying me. Would you pay me? That, doesn't, that would be kind of silly, wouldn't it? So, I mean, I, I, when I need, a, when I need I, I'm worried about something, and then I'm going to go to my boss who takes care of me, and I talk to him about it. And that's what I do. And... Uh, God has been good. I, I will say this little short story. I was, I was kind of stressing a little bit uh, because, there, you know, I'm the provider for the home. I feel, I feel that way. God, that's part of a man's job is to take care of his family and, you know, have a house and the kids need food and clothes and, and those kind of things. And my wife needs a car to drive around. And you'd say, well, you know, anyway, I, they're coming up to the States and I need a vehicle for my wife. And so I've been thinking, man, what am I going to do, and how am I going to work this out, and, and the funding wasn't quite there, and I'm going to, you know, with this whole virus thing, I don't know how long I'm going to be here. And, uh, and so I was, I was kind of worrying about it. I was talking to the Lord about it, trying to look at different options, maybe buy a car from the auction or do something different. 
And uh, I'm, I'm sitting Wednesday night. We're about ready to do this big concrete floor the next day. And a friend calls me on the phone and says, hey, I got a wave runner. Uh, that it's broke. And I'd like to get, I'd like to get it fixed. Uh, I'd like you to, my son would like to learn how to fix it. Do you have time to teach us? Yeah, I, I do have time, but I won't be back until the hangar until about 8. So 8 o'clock at night, I get up there, and we start working on this wave runner together, his son and I, my, this, my, this friend of mine. And it hadn't been running in seven years. But the Lord is good, and it wasn't anything really that complicated, and we got it to run. They were so surprised. His son had been trying, I supposedly, for a couple years to get it to run, and we had a, it took me about an hour to you know, kind of clean things up, and we got it running. And uh, at the end of our conversation, he, he said, my friend says, you know, Jeff, I've got a couple questions for you. So he asked me a few questions. And at the end of that, those questions, he says, you know, could you use a, mini, could you use a minivan? I have a minivan I'd like to donate. Yeah, actually, I could use a minivan. In fact, that's exactly what I need because I've got my niece with me. And that makes us, when we're driving around, that's more than five. And uh, the, that works out great. And he says, yeah. I said, you know. I'd like to give it to you. So he gave, donated a Honda Odyssey. Nice little minivan. And, uh, you know, my wife, I went, I finally just got the permit on Thursday to go pick her up in Belize, and I got back Monday night, and the minivan was tagged and titled Tuesday. Isn't that God good? God actually takes really good care of us. He always provides for us. And, uh, I mean, that's just, I mean, I just told you one little story that I, because I can tell you lots of stories that happened farther back. That was just last week. Uh, but God provides for us so much more uh, than that. But many times we doubt his goodness. And, uh, and we, don't, we don't move forward because the, the financial obstacle, we say, ah, this, is, this, can, this can never, you know, how do we do this? We look at our lunch. And we look at the need and we say, it's impossible. But what I want to tell you is that you move forward and you step forward and you use what you have, God will make it explode. He has done that over and over again. I remember I went after I had an airplane accident and uh, <clears throat> in a single engine, I decided, Lord, I need a, a twin. And uh, this, is, this is a few years back. And I went shopping for an airplane with just $2,000 just 2000 and the airplane cost around $140,000, kind of like, I felt like lad's lunch, and uh, yet I went, and I, I remember I uh, went and looked at all three of them, and on the one I liked the best, uh, the guy came down to $124,000, this was an 08, the market kind of slid, and it was helpful for me, and uh, so I talked to him. I said, listen, I only have $2,000, and uh, I, I, I want to leave a deposit so that I can come back and do an inspection. I had a, scheduled to do that foundation, all that concrete pouring that I told you about that I didn't want to do. That was scheduled the next week, and so I needed to go down and do that. And <laughs> at the end of doing all that discouraging work where I had just that ring, I flew back up to the States. To, he accepted the $2,000. He said, I'll take it off the market. And when you can come back in a month, then do the pre-buy and we'll make a deal. I said, and if you can't do it, then you lose your 2000 I said, no problem. We'll do that. So I, I risked all that I had. And I went to Bolivia and I came back and I was having a chat with the Lord. I was like, Lord, I, uh, you know, I'm a, I get a lot of, I get, got a lot of ideas. Not all of them are good. But remember, how do you? Remember what I talked about? How, how do you direct a parked car? Hard to steer a parked car. So, Lord, I'm moving forward on this, and you're going to have to show me that this is what you want me to do, because I really don't know. I don't have the ephod. Uh, and I would like to ask for a sign, but I would be worse than Gideon. And, you know, a lot of, you know, because we want to ask for a sign, but how do, we, how do we know what sign to ask for? Sometimes we put, we, Lots of people pop out a fleece, and then they're not quite so sure that that was the right fleece. And, you know, and we kind of, and I, I just, I, and I said, Lord, you're God. You know how to tell me. You, you know, do something that I'll, so I'll know, whatever you want to do. But I know that you know how to tell me that this is good. So you just figure out whatever you need to do to do that. And so I'm driving up from Atlanta, and uh, I get a phone call. I get a phone call from a, a gentleman who, who uh, 
works in a tree removal business. And I had, well, I went to look at my airplane. I looked at an airplane for him. Uh, just stopped by and see it. He asked me if I'd just pop in there and, and look at it. And uh, I did. And Anyway, I, didn't, I told him that I was going to look for an airplane, but I didn't tell him anything really much about it. And he says, you know, uh, I wanted to help with your airplane, and I sent a check. And uh, I sent a check for 20000 to the ministry. Now, I want to tell you that to that point, that was the biggest single donation that I had ever gotten. I, always, I just never got that kind of money. I was always in the hundreds and the thousand kind of racket. Never really broke, rarely broke the 10,000. And so this was the single largest donation that I've ever gotten. And I thought, wow, hey, that's a real down payment. So I went and we did the inspection and the plane was great. And I told Sonny, Sonny Wicks, I'll never forget his name. I said, Sonny, he was a Christian. I don't have another dollar, but I have $20,000 that I can leave as a down payment. And I explained to him exactly how that happened. And I said, it seems like to me that the good Lord is trying to say, move forward. And so I gave that 20000 to Sonny. And, he said, and I said, no, if you don't want to go forward on it, don't. That's okay. But if you do, and you see the Lord's hand in it, well, let's do it. And he said, no, I, I'm definitely willing to do that. I said, I'll pick up the plane when I have it paid for and so I uh, g gave him the 20000 Now, uh, that was actually, I said 08, but it was 09. In 08, 08 was the most difficult year of my life. Uh, 08, my middle child was born premature. I met evac my wife and her out, and she was two months in neonatal ICU. That was a very difficult time. I was flying. Uh, sometimes I would fly 16 hours a day. Uh, this is when I would I gave somebody instruction. I was having because I was the only pilot there, trying to fly everybody around. I remember, I took this one missionary family. It was the first time in an airplane, and I took off at 3 a.m. Uh, I hadn't slept much the night before, and I got I had a real tired spell. I just wanted to sleep just a little bit, so I taught him how to fly instruments. Gave him a little duel there. I said, Hey, listen, this little guy, this little wing here, just keep the wings level, and uh, it's real easy. Just keep you know. I had it all trimmed out and. He, I said, I'm going to close one eye just for a minute while you just do that. And so he'd, he'd nudge me, hey, 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 I think something's wrong. We'd, we'd be in a big bank going this way. I know, you're doing fine. You're doing it. And I'd turn it out, straight out. I'm up that poor missionary. He, but he made it. He, he stayed in the mission field in about nine years, so I must not have scared him too bad. Uh, or maybe he, his faith experience and his prayer life really increased just from the get-go. <laughs> You know, I tell people riding a motorcycle is not, well, flying is not the most dangerous thing. Riding motorcycles are. And uh, I, I think of riding motor, carrying passengers on my motorcycles as a ministry. You know, people really pray when they get on the back. And so, uh, anyway, this, uh, now I got kind of rabbit trailed like John does. Thanks, John. Huh? Sonny Wicks. So, uh, uh, and the hard year of life. So I, I had the, uh, so I'm flying a bunch. You know, I go back to land at 9 o'clock at night, go down to the hospital, see my wife, see my child. While I was at the hospital, I was able to give Bible studies to another pilot friend of mine who had pancreatitis and, uh, you know, divine appointments. Always just constant, constant thing. And then, uh, and then I, had the, I had engine failure at night. Wrecked a borrowed airplane, uh, an airplane of, that cost $350,000. I balled it up. You know, but praise the Lord, it wasn't just the airplane that was a problem. I had passengers that were injured, and it was a real, real stressful time. You know, when you, uh, the responsibility, I was, uh, anyway, Fauna said I looked old when I got back. Uh, and so I was burned out. That was probably the only time in my missionary career that I really felt like that. I'm a people person. I, have, I say I have verbal diarrhea. I just can kind of just talk and talk. And uh, so, but I really didn't want to see people. I just wanted to kind of crawl in a hole. And, I, and, and I, I told the Lord, you know, I need a break. And I had an opportunity to go up and see my sister in Alaska. My parents were going to drive up there. And uh, I was supposed to fly back to Bolivia. That, so that was a Thursday that I made the deal with Sonny. Sunday, I'm visiting with my parents. They're about to leave for Alaska. And I made a last-minute decision to just go to Alaska and take a month off. And I told the Lord, I was like, Lord, you know, you're just going to have to figure out how you're going to pay for your airplane, because I don't know how. And I, I need a break. And so I climbed in that van, 
and we headed for Alaska. And I hadn't even left Michigan yet when the office called me and said, you know, you got a wire transfer in for that airplane for $40,000. What would you like us to do with that weather? Now, I haven't, there's no newsletter, there's no web page, there's no postcard, there's no nothing. I don't know how they found out about it, but they, the Lord put it on someone's heart to give that money. And uh, I want to tell you, by the time I, when I left Alaska to come back, I picked up the airplane. And it, I, I want to say this to you because it's not about, we often kind of think, well, he's this great fundraiser guy or he's got this pro It's not about that. It's about and when we work for the boss, I, I really don't mind doing whatever kind of work that he wants to do. And he, not only, <laughs> I am the most spoiled person ever, I will tell you that. So when I started the school in MOVE, we left Boli uh, Bolivia and uh, we, I had, by the way, I started out with nothing there. Well, you know, my wife and I, and now we have, you know, three children. Uh, I had the car, the motorcycle, a couple of containers full of tools, the block machine, the 2007 dump truck F650 with my John Deere 310 backhoe, uh, a couple of power trowels, had four airplanes. Uh, things were starting to move quite nicely. And I just felt more convicted than ever that I needed to go start a missionary training center. And I told my life that we needed to pack up and we're going to move. And we're going to move in that airplane, that small, that, that twin that I'd bought. And I'm actually taking a few other passengers with me and we're going to take 100 pounds. Now, my wife had also, we'd been blessed there. You know, we, we, uh, while we were there, you know, missionaries would leave and we'd buy the fridge or we'd get some, you know, you know kind of help them out or this or that or the other thing. And so we've got the Vitamix and the Champion Juicer and the food dehydrator and, you know, the Sam Campbell set of books, the bedtime story. Which things do we fit in the 100 pounds, you know? And boy, I'll tell you, the missionaries were excited. It was, they were, hey, who's going to get the Champion Juicer? Who's going to get the XL 250, you know? And what about the car? And who's going to stay in the house? And and uh, I thought, you know, and some people say, well, why don't you sell that stuff in the, or take it to Belize with you? And I thought, you know, that's not growing. And uh, so we moved with 100 pounds to Belize, and we started all over again. I was praying that God would give me a, a big uh, resort. You know, I'm tired of building. I just, put, I just built a 17,000-square-foot building, and it was m just unbelievable amounts of work. Then I just built another house, and I'm... I'm like, you know, God, really, just why don't let's do it. You know, you've got all the money in the world. Let's do a resort, and then we can start off right away, and I don't have to. You know what he gave me? He gave me a cane field, an old cane farm, just straight bush, nothing on it. I remember clearing for the first house with machetes and digging the first foundation with a pickaxe. And I thought, man, Lord, this is, this is unbelievable. And uh, I remember it was, it was just... Uh, starting out was so, uh, it was difficult. I remember I, we were just tight financially. I remember I borrowed my dad's truck, and uh, I didn't have really a lot of money to put diesel in it at the time, so I went down to the airport and got their used motor oil bin and built myself a filter. He has an old 7.3 diesel, and I just pumped that truck full of used motor oil. And that thing would smoke, and people would say, you know, it looks like you're burning a little oil. I said, yep, I am. I'm burning a whole lot more than you never imagined. <laughs> Had a U-Haul that we got, and I, I, I put, and my buddy would, he, and it says diesel only on the can, and he's like, you know, I've seen you put everything but diesel in that tank. <laughs> I've seen you put motor oil and veggie oil and gasoline and all kinds of things to kind of mix that up, and that old, we had that old thing smoking down the highway, and, uh, you know, it was something else. Daddy, he wanted to strangle me. He, I had, we packed that thing full of stuff to send to Belize, and it wouldn't get over 35 mile an hour. <laughs> he's got to go down I-75, and he's trying to get up to the minimum speed, you know? He was happy when he hit Florida and got flat, and he could kind of almost, with a tailwind, he'd kind of get up to about 50. And uh, he was kind of worried about it. He took it into a shop to have him look at, maybe it was the filter, and the guy pulls out the fuel filter, and it, it's just dripping with motor oil. He's like, I thought I got the fuel filter. He's like... <laughs> Oh, Dad's like, oh, that's not a problem. It must be something else. And anyway, what? 
Turns out, good thing you never had to roll over a set of scales. We had that, that old U-Haul, but the reason it wouldn't get over 35 wasn't because of the, the oil. I had the, that thing was, I think when I got my bill of lading from the shipping company, it was at 40,000 pounds. Uh, it was only a 20,000 pounds over gross, you know. <laughs> you know, God is good. Uh, I, why I want to tell you that I'm spoiled is I ended up selling that airplane that I bought, the God's gift. I sold it to start this school in Belize, and I thought, man, I'm going to never fly again. It was really kind of a heart-wrenching thing. I thought, you know, because I'm a pilot. I, like fly, I just like airplanes, too. And, uh, and I like tools. And, but, you know, God began to bless and bless and bless. And, you know, now in Belize, I, had, I have more than I ever had in Bolivia. Uh, it's stuff, just like what we would. And, it, and, and it's just stuff. But it's tools. So I have a shop in Belize. And I have a TIG welder and a MIG welder and an ARC welder, a diesel jet welder generator. A diesel, it's a tool people might kind of understand. I've got a milling machine, a lathe. I've got a roll machine that makes metal studs. I have, you know, it's a big shop, 60 by 60, and I've got two of, two of them. They're right 50 feet from my house. And, and then we have about 27,000 square foot of buildings there that God's blessed us and, 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 helped, us, and helped us do that. And, and now uh, I... God did a bunch of miracles, and I'm flying an 11-seat uh, pressurized twin turbine airplane that God did another. I, could, I mean, I could, tell you, I could tell you all these miracle stories all, all morning long, but we do have to eat breakfast eventually. <laughs> but uh, luckily, I like to eat, so I won't go over too much. But uh, what I want to share with you is, is that it's, it's, it's not about how much it's not about, uh, you know, and I don't do any of the right things as far as for the, the fundraising thing. I don't do the newsletters. I don't do the AS. And not that those things aren't good. They're, I'm not knocking any of that. I just don't do that. I just work for the boss. And I try and do faithfully that task, and I try and seek first the kingdom of God. And instead of trying to hold on, you know, when you, re- you, you read the story of the rich young ruler, and I, I don't know if you've ever kind of felt compassion for him, but I, I kind of read that and I think, like, why did God ask him to give, sell everything that he had and give it to the poor? He didn't do that to Nicodemus. Nicodemus was rich. He didn't tell Nicodemus, hey, Nicodemus, come and sell all that you have and give it to the poor. He didn't even say that to Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was rich. But he sent it to this rich young ruler. And I kind of like, man, and he was offended because of maybe if he had been a little more diplomatic, again, giving God advice, been a little more dipl- diplomatic, we might have, they could have had a real good asset for the disciples, you know, a funding resource. And he turned away, and, and, I, and but then I re- as I realized, do you know that Jesus was giving the rich young ruler the most amazing invitation to explode? He could have taken that and planted all that seed. And he would have had a harvest that you would have never imagined. The more you give, the more you receive. The higher that percentage is, the more it explodes. It's not the amount, it's the percent. And if you invest the higher percent, the greater the explosion. The only way to learn those principles, because right now you're hearing me tell you those stories, and you think, I could never do that. The only way you'll learn is by practice. You have to try it for yourself. There's no way, you, you can't, I cannot describe to you a recipe and you'll never know how it tastes until you eat it. But I can tell you that if God can do that for me, he can do it for you. He can provide for anyone. He is totally willing to do that. But he, we have to be willing, he doesn't force us to give that. And the more you risk and give, the more you will receive. And uh, anyway, I am just so blessed. And, uh, you know, we're, we're working on all kinds of projects, moving things forward. And, and every, uh, my, my accountants, they, they don't, they ask me, Jeff, well, you know, what about this bill and that? Why are you helping that person? You know, we're going to have this coming up. But I think, you know, th- this bill will come when it, when it comes. We'll take care of it. The need is right now. Let me, we'll share and God will always bless us back. Anyway, I wish there was more time. I wish I could tell you more of those, more stories. But uh, that's.
That's kind of it in a real, real brief nutshell. Practice. You have to practice. Try it. And uh, it's the small things that explode. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, we just want to thank you so much for the opportunity that you have given us to be co-laborers with you, the opportunity that you have given us, Lord, to share the blessings that we have received. Lord, we are so blessed. And what a blessing it is to be able to bless others. But oftentimes, Lord, we think of our own needs first. And we are fearful uh, of, of sharing those things because we think, well, what will we have if we do? But, Lord, we forget that it's a flowing. You are the one who has given us those blessings, and you are more and able to give us more. Lord, help us to be able to experience those miracles. Lord, we want to see the explosions, but, Lord, help us not to miss the small details that allow for that. Help us to always look for those divine appointments. In Jesus' name we pray.